Welcome to this video on supporting behaviour positively. We're focusing on making meaning from our observations of other people's behaviours or even our own. When behaviour is inappropriate for the context, this means that other people will often see that behaviour as challenging. So for example, screaming during a church service or throwing chairs in the middle of the classroom or hitting somebody in the street who is just walking past you. These things are all inappropriate in the context. When we see behaviours that are inappropriate for their context, what we need to think about is, is that behaviour an overload, survival behaviour response due to the person being in sympathetic nervous system overload? And that's where the primal part of the brain takes over and there is no ability to have a conscious choice over what you do. It is a survival brain um, directed behaviour. Or alternatively, if it isn't a sympathetic nervous system overload or survival behaviour response, what is the behaviour trying to achieve? What is that individual aiming to get out of that behaviour or trying to communicate, communicate through that behaviour? If the behaviour is an overload behaviour, then we need to think about and try and find out why that person is overloaded and what we can change in the environment, including the ways that we communicate with that person to minimise the risk of overload for them in the future. One of the ways that we can look at if the behaviour is overload is to really start to understand what contexts often result in dysregulation or stress or distress for that individual. And as we do this, we also need to identify the signs and indicators that that person gives off to indicate their stress and distress, even if they themselves don't realise that they are stressed or distressed. When we're doing this, we need to make sure that we work with the individual themselves and their families if that's relevant and other support professionals if that's relevant, always making sure that we have consent to work with people to collect and collate this information. One of the ways that you can do this is by recording the individual's regulation zones. So this is an example of a regulation zone chart. This regulation zone chart comes from the Education Department in South Australia and the website where you can access this is on the slide. Now this um, has really closely linked the description of the person's zone, regulation zone, with the autonomic nervous system state. So when we're in parasympathetic dominant, PNS dominant, that is our comfort zone. So that's when you're relaxed, you're chilled, perhaps blocked on the couch. And then our learning zone can really be split into two. The beginning of learning zone is really when you're in homeostasis, your autonomic nervous system, your parasympathetic and sympathetic are in balance. Now at this time you are learning but you're not really being challenged particularly. As we get challenged we become slightly sympathetic nervous system dominant. That's when we talk about good stress. So that's when things might be a little bit difficult for you and as you learn to do them they become less challenging, they become less stressful. So that's that good level of stress. And then we move into the not so good levels of stress and we have called these panic zone and that's when you're sympathetic nervous system dominant. So not slightly but considerably dominant. In the beginning of the panic zone which you might call low level panic, you can still be co-regulated then or you can still self-regulate at that point. However when you go into sympathetic nervous system overload you absolutely cannot think control your emotions or your actions. That is when you're in complete panic zone, complete survival behaviour. So if we go through that with the hand model of the brain, remember with the hand model of the brain that this is your spinal column, this is your brain stem, we open it out, this is where the primal brain sits, this is your emotions and these are the thinking cap of the brain and just here where the fingernail touches the palm of the hand, that's your mindfulness and your in the moment part of the brain. So as you get stressed and distressed, as you become sympathetic dominant, this is what happens. And the thinking cap lifts off, lifts off until you become big emotions. 
and the emotions are in control of you and that would probably be in the first panic zone and then quite often if you're not regulated or co-regulated this is what happens and the emotions stop being in control and the survival brain the primal brain is in control and we manage to do interoception activity or we slowly calm down ourselves we reconnect the mindfulness part of our brain through the interoception activity and we've gone back into being in homeostasis or even parasympathetic dominant and that's our comfort zone so this is your comfort zone in your beginning of a learning zone and this is the more um, active learning zone so here's an example of a regulation scale this is an example using board maker symbols these regulation scales that go with this um, format have five sections the comfort zone parasympathetic dominant, the learning zone split into two where you're in homeostasis and where you're in slight SNS dominance, the panic zone split into two zones, so that bottom zone, the sympathetic nervous system dominant but not overloaded, you can still possibly regulate yourself and you can certainly be co-regulated at that point, however when you tip over into that top panic zone, that SNS overload, that is your survival instinct mode, you cannot be co-regulated or self-regulated in that. So as you can see, this regulation scale is split into four sections, the zones, and then why do I feel like that? These are the contextual factors. So what are the contexts that promote, provoke or trigger or ensure that somebody is in these zones? Then the middle section, what signals am I getting from my body? What interoception signals do I have at this point? Many children and adults don't actually know when you do this with them. And so this can be done through observation and then keep revisiting with the child or individual. And as we revisit, it will become more and more accurate. So as we can see here, we've got comfort zone, I feel tingly. The tingly might not be an, a, a feeling that you personally associate with your body when you're in your comfort zone. And it's possible that this child had selected that and because they liked the picture and as time went on they might revisit and say actually no tingly isn't what I mean what I mean is something else pick another picture the last section what can I or someone else do to help this is about getting people to stay in or return to learning zone and possibly to return to comfort zone if it's somebody that's heightened a lot so these are things that are really important to help the person regulate. So these are the co-regulation and self-regulation strategies. If we have a look at this example, again they've got the same layout. This person hasn't picked any pictures for their comfort zone, learning zone and panic zones. It's possible that they might have words, it's possible that they might have icons, cartoon characters, all kinds of things. So this can all be individualized. The South Australian Department for Education has this on their website as a Word document. So what you can do is you can just edit it however you want and insert pictures or board maker or words. So Jenny's regulation scale is an example of a child with externalizing behaviors. And if you have a look at their why do I feel like this, these things are fairly common for children and young people and their body signals are very interesting because we can see that externalizing behaviors start to occur in that low panic zone so that swearing starts to occur in that low panic zone and at this point they can still be co-regulated or prompted to self-regulate and Jenny has got in her what can I or someone else do to help stop talking and it's not really clear from this if she means herself to stop talking or everybody else around her to stop talking. But the next line, focus on slowing down my breathing to slow down my brain, that's a really good example of something that can be prompted, modelled and parallel engaged in. So instead of going up and saying you need to calm down, which is not usually a very successful strategy, you could go and stand not too close but relatively close and start modeling really slow breathing and as Jenny sees that Jenny might 
start to do that and if she doesn't you can prompt her to do that. This is in itself an interoception activity. She also asks to be reminded that it's okay that her heart is beating strongly and that it's her body's way of telling her to take a break, to walk to a safe place, to do an interoception activity. Once she gets into that full-on survival mode, that SNS overload, you can notice that this is about giving space and time because there is no possibility to self-regulate or be co-regulated at this moment in time. Jeremy's regulation is fairly similar to Jenny's in terms of why do I feel like this, but when you look at the body signals, they are quite different and the behaviours are quite different. So Jeremy is an internaliser, somebody that in that survival mode, instead of being fight or flight, is more of a freeze, flop, drop. So Jeremy is trying to hide, curl up in a ball, cut, move his body, he has quite similar strategies in terms of what can I or someone else do to help in that freeze mode. But when you go a little bit further down, he needs more prompting and he's stated that he needs more prompting. He also has a blanket or security object that can really help for him. Again, an interoception activity will ensure that he biochemically calms down because he activates that parasympathetic so he moves out from being dominant into homeostasis. If we look at his slight SNS dominance, getting a drink of water, having something to eat, this was a recognition from Jeremy that he is often dehydrated and he's not good at remembering to eat, he doesn't have a sense of hunger. And so when he's starting to get a stomach ache, which may or may not be from work being too difficult, from a change, from someone telling him he's wrong, he notices that having a drink of water, having something to eat can often help. Now it might be that you have a child or an adult that you work with that having something to eat is a comfort eating and actually isn't helping. So you might want to do a different kind of interoception activity for them. Now, Let's have a look at how we can complete one of these together. Firstly, when you're thinking about completing one of these, you need to make sure you've got a really good knowledge of the individual and their likes and dislikes. And any body language that they present with prior to going into that survival instinct behaviour. So prior to them being completely sympathetic nervous system overloaded. And also their body language behaviours during times when they're engaged with activities, really doing things and seem to be enjoying them. So that's your learning zone um, body language, your learning zone interoceptive skill cues. Secondly, when you're doing these, they are living documents and you need to keep checking in with the individual to make sure that you're recording accurate information. And over time, people will change and the triggers will change and the stressors will change. So those contextual factor boxes will change but also the way that their body feels might change and the way that they um, regulate or require co-regulating can also change. So let's have a go. This is Xavier's regulation scale and Xavier really enjoys walking his dog in the park when no one else is around. Although it's not a um, full on, wow, this is amazing. It's his calm, happy space. So this was his parasympathetic dominant, his comfort zone. And the way that he knows that he's in this is that his feet feel heavy in his shoes and his arms move gently. Now Xavier is not particularly interested in other people and his reminder if he wants to move into the learning zone is to say hello to somebody else when he's walking his dog. Now for Xavier, a homeostasis activity might be making his lunch but only when the food he likes is in the cupboard and the fridge and the microwave is working. His legs are a little heavier and his arms are a little heavier. So for Xavier, a prompt if he wants to really stretch himself in learning and to move into that slight SNS dominance is when the microwave hasn't heated the food to the right temperature. And what is helpful for him is if he remembers or someone helps him remember that it's okay if the food is not the right temperature. He can reheat it, he can heat it a bit more. 
One of the things that Xavier identified as being a really active learning engagement task for him was planning a trip to a new place. So Xavier is passionate about buses and trains. And for Xavier, when he's doing a trip that he does regularly, this is a homeostasis learning zone activity, but planning somewhere new is moving into that active learning, that slight SNS dominant. He finds that his hands are heavy and his head can be tight when he's doing active learning and it's new learning. In order to prevent himself from tipping over into that panic zone, he can ask for help with the transport planner or he can go to the bus station for help if he's not able to work out a good route that works in terms of time or other kinds of factors that are important for Xavier. He identified that when he misses his stop on the bus, he gets quite distressed and this is a sympathetic nervous system dominant state. He can still self-regulate or be co-regulated at this point. His other kind of factor of trigger is that a train not arriving on time when he is going out on the train. When this happens, he says his head hurts and his hands are big and the fingers hurt. By hands being big, he means that they stretch out wide like this and he finds that that hurts his fingers to do that. He knows that if he gets off the bus at the next stop, it can remedy it. He just needs to cross over the road, wait for the bus to, to come and he can get the bus back to the stop before or if it's not too far, he can walk. However, once he's got off the bus, He's identified himself that he needs to do his hand tense and relax interoception activity in order to calm down enough to be able to keep going through with the solution. So this is his activity. He has his hand relaxed and then he stretches it really wide, which is what he's doing anywhere in his panic zone, and then he deliberately relaxes it again and stretches out and relaxes again. And what that does is it helps him to activate his interoceptive part of his brain and the mindfulness part of his brain. Because when he's doing the hand stretch and relax, what he actually does is he focuses on how his fingers feel down the sides. And in that mindful body awareness, he has to connect the mindfulness part of the brain. So the hand model of the brain, he's gone from here all the way back down to here. And as we know, that brings you back into homeostasis or into parasympathetic dominant, which means that he's neurologically calm again. However, things that for him are contextual factors that mean he will always go into survival mode, panic zone, his SNS overload is getting lost or if all the trains are cancelled. At this point, what happens for him is that his arms and legs will move around a lot, so he will flail a lot, and his head hurts and his voice is very loud. Xavier often screams when he gets lost or the trains are cancelled. When Xavier is screaming or flailing around, he's identified that people need to not be close to him. They need to stand away from him and show him his arm stretch and relax activity. This is an interoception activity where he puts his arms right out, which you can't see me doing, but it's right, right out, and where you stretch your fingers and then you bring him down again. And this helps him to focus on the muscles here in his arms and when he's focusing on those muscles in arm he can feel them relaxing and as he does that remember he's doing the mindful body awareness so he's going from here right down to here and the mindfulness is connected and that is activating his parasympathetic nervous system so this pro forma, when it's completed, it gives us some really good strategies and some really good information for when things are happening day to day in real time. So for example, if Xavier says his head hurts or he stretches his fingers out wide, we know to implement the calming strategy of hand tensing and relaxing. So no matter what the context is, because we know that at that point he's going to keep escalating unless we do that. One of the things that we can do, because we know he enjoys being with his dog and can talk about his next walk as a, we can talk about his next walk as a strategy. So when he's stuck in a now is forever and now is terrible moment, so he's missed a stop and it's a very long way back to the other one, so he has to wait for the bus to come back on the other side of the road to take him back. And he's forgotten to do his hand tensing and relaxing. What we can do is we can start to talk about his dog and where he's going to walk it and that will help to shift the thinking and 
then we will be able to prompt him to do his hand tensing and relaxing into reception activity. One of the things that this is also identified is that Xavier struggles with planning and he may have to be actively prompted to ask for help or ask to be wants help if he starts to indicate tightness in his head. So even though it's really good for him to do the planning, it might be that there are other contextual factors that mean he will trip over into that panic zone unless he gets help. And sometimes he won't remember to ask for help, so he'll need to be asked if he wants help. So as you can see, this is a really practical tool that enables you to work with individuals day to day using some really simple observational tools and contextual factors as indicators of how to work to support them positively with their behaviour. So when we can identify that the individual is in their comfort or learning zone, it's really useful because we know, okay, this is fine, we can push a few new things, and we can see when they're tripping up into that getting towards the end of their learning zone, beginning to be in that low level panic. And we've got some co-regulation strategies identified already that we know work for that individual so that we can scaffold self-regulation for them. So co-regulation is scaffolding that self-regulation so that they can exit the lower panic zone or not enter it and certainly try and prevent them escalating to full panic zone. Now sometimes you only have about five or ten seconds to do this so you really need to be looking out for those body signals to tell you okay here's the time to be doing some co-regulation. But what this proforma has also done is identified key contextual factors that act as stresses and chronic stresses. And if we're aware of these and we're aware that these can push individuals into full panic zone and prevent them from returning to learning or comfort zones, then we can move on to that next step, which we'll cover in the next video. And the next steps are to develop strategies to manage those contextual factors, either to avoid the contextual stresses or to manage them um, in the longer term. And these need to be planned and these strategies implemented and we'll cover those in the next video. Thank you.